You're listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, brought to you by the Raven Creek Social Club, where we talk about faith and other oddities. For questions, comments, or to be part of the conversation, join us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can find us at Raven Creek SC. Now for your hosts, Emily Dixon and Nathan Underwood. Hey everyone, welcome to Faith and Other Oddities, the show where Emily and I read the Bible, talk about it, record it, and release it into the wild via the internet. Um, <laughs> so, last time you were here, we were uh, we done we had we had gone through uh, Psalm twenty, and then we had returned to First Samuel eight, Second Samuel, Second Samuel, 18. yeah, So we need to need to keep keep straight where we are, so no one gets confused. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, yeah. So. I have to review my notes every week to remember exactly where we left off because there's so much. You know, when you study ahead and then you have to go back and pick up, and then just trying to figure out which way's up and all that good stuff. So yeah, we talked last week about um, David's generals and who they were and um, why they were significant and how they were were servants of David and how the servants of the anointed Messiah were actually more powerful than the men of the land. And we talked about how that can actually influence how we read New Testament teachings on being servants of God, children of the kingdom. What does that look like? And we spent a lot of time on that. So now we're going to pick up in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 18. And um, it says that the battle spread over the face of all the country and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword. So now this is a crazy, crazy kind of verse. And, you know, if you listen to Dr. Heiser, then you know if it's weird, it's important. And uh, man, when you read that, there's just this tendency to fly past it because it doesn't seem to make sense. How does the forest devour? Yeah. So yeah. When I, when I read that, I was like, "Oh man, we surely we've got some kind of interesting, like you know, Lord of the Rings, the Battle of the Ents thing <laughs> going on here, or Wizard of Oz with the angry trees." And that's that's what I was hoping for whenever we we encountered that. Did you find anything like that? I, I actually did. So um, a little bit of context. So let's go through a little bit of the verse, and then we're going to jump on over to a paper I found, and we're going to talk about that and what uh, this wonderful scholar has come up with. Um, first of all, we know that David's three-pronged attack is working, because remember, the three generals that he gave each of them a division of men, and they went out into the forest. And really, none of the commentators that I have and um, in the, any of the books said much of anything. Uh, the Targums, they say that the men were attacked by animals. That has to be what it means because, you know, the forest doesn't actually devour. So we're talking about the creatures within the forest, right? Uh, Raddick says that it's because the men were constantly entangled in the, the brush and the branches and the briars, and that's how the forest devoured these men. Now, Alter, he Which, I mean, I, I, takes could, them. I could see that as a legitimate... Uh interpretation mm-hmm. because if you've ever walked through very thick forest underbrush it's mm-hmm. it's pretty rough oh yeah yeah i mean we've we've done a lot of hiking here in oklahoma and you've got those wonderful thorns and vines that like to just form curtains that you can hardly get mm-hmm. through and so you know it, it does make sense if you're reading this as an idiom now alter kind of takes a middle ro- road and he says yeah they could have been entangled in the branches but it could have been that they ki- killed each other in their confusion, which we've seen that happen before mm-hmm. in the biblical accounts. Bergen, man, crickets. He doesn't even acknowledge it. He just like sweeps right by it. Brueggemann says that it's probably literary preparation for Absalom's fate. So, okay, you know, you kind of get that. We know that the writer of First Samuel or Second Samuel or all the Samuels actually is really very, um, very good at doing those little foreshadowing and those little literary devices and making use of them in every mm-hmm. way he possibly can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that, that was more... one of the things that I did think of, too, was like, oh, this is kind of, a, it, it's a, its own parallel. Yeah. It, well, yeah, the, the, the fate of the leader would mirror the fate of the people. And so we, we see, have seen that, and we saw that in the Psalms, how the victory of the king and the victory of their leader was actually a victory for the people, and how the two overlap and why they work together. Then we have uh, Zamora, who the, he offered the literal translation, and he was 
uh, correct. I mean, we expect that, right? Um, it says the, the forest multiplied to eat the people. So it means the people perished. More people died fleeing in the forest than actually were killed. Now, of course, you already mentioned that the Tolkien's explanation would be Ents and Brahms would be fighting trees or angry trees. But, you know, we've already encountered so many supernatural events within the story. And if we believe, like uh, Dr. Vance um, suggests, that Judges and Samuel were written by the same person, then we have these other events where, like in Judges 5, that the heavens dropped and that the, the river rushed and swept, through, swept, swept away the Philistine army. Or Judges 7, when, when God did confuse the troops and they did kill each other. And so we've got these various times where there is this um, interplay between the, the natural and the supernatural that's been alluded to by this writer. So to see something supernatural in David's victory would not be all that astounding. We, we should be kind of prepared for that. Right. And just uh, one point of clarification, uh, I think you meant Baum, as in the writer Wizard of Oz. Brahms, yeah, Brahms is a composer or ice cream and dairy store. I gave him an extra letter because I was feeling generous, okay? <laughs> Um, and all the things good <laughs> come from Brahms, right? No. Uh, so anyway, but because I didn't find anything, you know, in my commentaries that really, nothing left me happy. Nothing really felt satisfying. Uh, I went back and I did some more research and I actually found this dissertation by Mary Jorstad. And I, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's spelled J-O-E-R-S-T-A-D. And it's her doctoral dissertation for Duke University. She wrote this in 2016. The, the title is The Life of the World, The Vitality and Personhood of Nature in the Hebrew Bible. Now, she makes a, some really interesting observations, and I just want to take some time to go through some of the high points of her paper. Um, we will be sharing this because it is, uh, you know, it's open to the public. So if you're interested in this sort of thing, you can definitely go further. Uh, it's, I thought she did a great job. So she argues that the Hebrew Bible, that in the Hebrew Bible, the writers viewed non-animal nature as active and alive, that is, as persons. Mm -hmm. Rather than viewing nature and its elements as raw material or landscape, they described the heavens and earth, mountains, trees, and rivers as a, a sorry, rivers as creatures that engage with other creatures and are able to hear and obey commands, protest human misconduct, lament and offer praise, and affect human history. So she's making some pretty bold claims here about the nature of nature, about the nature of creation. Now, she, she opens up and she cites Terrence, uh, Terrence Fretheim, uh, his book, The Theology of Creation, and she lists a number of verses that he cites, and you know, he cites uh, Isaiah 44, 23. And in that verse, Isaiah calls to the mountains, forest, and trees to break forth in shouts of joy. In Psalms 148, the sun, the moon, the heavens, the waters above the heavens, the deeps, the fire and hail, snow and frost, strong wind, the mountains, hills, uh, fruit trees, and cedars are supposed to join in a chorus of praise to Yahweh. But Jorstad goes on to say this, this doesn't even begin to scratch the surface. And there are a number of texts that attribute what we consider human activity to non-animal elements in creation. Mm -hmm. And so she adds to this argument, so you can look at Jeremiah 4.12, where the heavens should be horrified. Joshua 10.12, where, where Joshua commands the sun and the moon to stand still. Deuteronomy 4.26, 30.29, Moses calls on the heavens and the earth to bear witness against Israel, that they actually have the ability to perceive and to testify on the, the uh, behavior and conduct of humanity. Now, Jorstad argues that we've been inattentive to the personalistic uh, na nature text, and this is in, due in part to uh, religion theory and how it's been taught through the ages. And she explores some of these ideas, and I thought it was interesting because we all know that we have things that impact how we read the Bible. We, all know, we, we know we've got our filters, we've got our bias, and we aren't even aware of them. And so when you have somebody actually quantify and label the progression of how, you know, 
how we came to these views. Why did we start teaching the Bible this way? When did we start discounting supernatural pa- passages? Uh, when did we stop teaching that there's these, these amazing things that happen in the Bible that defy human explanation? Then, then you can start to go, wait a minute, am I being shaped by what's in the Bible or am I being shaped by culture? And so this whole study was kind of a slap in the face for me because there are things that I was reading that I didn't even realize how much I was inserting and imposing on the text because of my cultural bias. So I want to look at some of these, um, these uh, what she calls intellectual trends that have impacted the way we view the Bible and how it relates particularly to this passage, but also an overall reading of the text. So she, she begins with religious evolution, and religious evolution, by and large, is basically um, based on Hegel's uh, model. And in his model, the oldest, most primitive form of religion is nature worship. And so basically the people saw natural phenomenon, storms, earthquakes, and all of these things as being evidence that nature was divine. And so you worship nature as a way to exert some kind of control or influence on whether or not you had a good year with your crops, whether your, um, your fields would actually produce enough to support your family. And so you offered, you know, some kind of offering sacrifice to make sure that these, these um, natural elements would actually provide for your family and provide for your community. Now, the next step in this model, excuse me, nature is devalued and humanity frees itself from nature. And now nature is still something to be in awe of, but it's not divine. It relies on something or someone divine in order to exist, to, to manifest. So instead of praying directly to the storm, you pray to the storm God. Instead of praying to the, the ground, you pray to the God that represents the ground. And so now you have this, this separation between creation and creator. So this is something that we, we definitely see. We, we understand this concept that there might be some kind of, of natural, uh, supernatural power behind what we witness. Now, um, Ernest, G. Ernest Wright builds on Hegel's model to claim that the ancient Israelites broke with ancient conceptions about nature and God. Therefore, Israel did not see any imminent power in nature. And he says, man alone among the uh, creatures of the earth is able to receive and act on God's visitation. And I think most of us, this kind of is where we are, that we were unique in creation. Only human beings can actually respond to God that, you know, we're kind of the only ones that God cares about. Uh, But Jorstad actually says this may not be correct, and she offers some arguments on this. Uh, Here's her response. She says, in this argument, there's no space for joyful trees, luminaries with religious obligations, or battle-ready waterways. As portrayals, I'm sorry, to take the personalistic nature text seriously as portrayals of non-humans would be for right to return to paganism. So, I mean, and and I think we've been taught that, that if you think that there is any kind of ability within the created world to respond either to prayers or commands or even God to to command these things, we're talking about paganism here. We're talking about animism here, where every tree has a spirit or every rock has a spirit. And, you know, that idea we kind of feel is primitive in the modern church. I think that's pretty common. I, I don't think many people would argue with that. Now, Hegel's model concludes with absolute religion, and he identifies Christianity as the only absolute religion, and he recognizes God as absolute spirit within this model. And this is a really simplified explanation of what absolute religion means. So, you know, if you want to study this further, you've got to go into Hegel, which is philosophy. And while I enjoy philosophy, I wasn't going to read the tomes written on this to try to, uh, to present anything because we would have been here for days. Sure. But <laughs> anyway, the, the nutshell version of what Hegel says is that absolute religion is when man is conscious of God being conscious within the man. So we understand that God is aware of us, we're aware of God, and there's that kind of um, 
symbiotic relationship where the two are aware of each other and they're aware of how they impact and influence each other. Now, um, man in this model is very distinct from the creator, but he's present, it, the creator is present in the mind of man. Therefore, this excludes any other created being from knowing the presence and power of God. So only humanity, again, only humanity can have the ability to be aware of God, uh, can respond to God, and do these things that we hear about so often in the the scripture. And we're going to talk some more about where the scripture talks about creation um, responding to God. Now, the second intellectual trend that she cites is anthropology. And she says, this is what has led us away from a literal reading of the text. So in anthropology, instead of absolute religion being the pinnacle, science is the pinnacle of um, achievement in our understanding of God. So in stage one, humanity has to survive. And when we're talking about early humans, survival is so based and founded on what's happening in nature around you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I've never met anyone who prays as much as a farmer. I mean, it's just like instinctual. Because, you know, you look out on the horizon and there's storms coming and you got to get the crop in before they get there. I mean, you just, it, it just kind of just blows out. You've got to pray. So um, within this framework, uh, to speak of nature as having any kind of, of personhood would be vestiges of our earlier evolutionary selves. Um, it, it's all about survival. And therefore, these passages within the Bible that speak of nature acting and responding is actually pretty useless. Uh, they, they are uh, of no real function or value within the Bible itself and therefore have no revelatory value in the text of Scripture. Now, Jeffrey Tige, uh actually says this as the vestal motif that has lost its original value to the text. So, I mean, he's pretty clear that these texts where nature is responding to God or even people, because remember in Joshua, God, uh, Joshua commands the Son which is very interesting because I had always assumed, you know, we're taught in Sunday school, God stopped the sun and the moon. And that's not what the text says. The text literally says that Joshua commands it and they listen, that the sun and the moon obey him, which is really interesting. So um, what I really enjoyed about Jorstedt's uh, paper were the multiple sources that she, she cited that actually talk about this being a magical uh, kind of inclusion within the Bible. And so if you're familiar with Fraser, who wrote The Golden Bough, um, we know that another intellectual trend within the ideas of how religion was formed is that you begin with magic, which is very much that control and that understanding of natural phenomenon as being some kind of spiritually driven event. And then we move to religion within Frazier's framework, and then to science. So Frazier kind of combines those two intellectual trends. And in this list of people that consider these nature texts to be those vestal uh, motifs of of, uh, nature religion that are not functional today, uh, she has Robert Carroll, and he says about Jeremiah 22, 29, as it hints at at a magical process behind the words. So when Jeremiah... uh, 22, 29 is talking about commanding re- uh, the nature to, to respond to God. This is what it is. It, it's magic in his words. Klaus Westerman on Genesis 4 says we're in the realm of magic. And if you remember, Genesis 4 is when uh, Cain kills Abel and the earth swallows up Abel's blood. Thomas Dozman in Joshua 10, 12, that passage I was just talking about, describes Joshua's command as an incantation. So as Christians, since we condemn the practice of magic as, on theological grounds, and then as people of science, we condemn the practice of magic on practical grounds, we, we deny the efficacy of magic to, to shape and form our world, which means that there's this tendency to pull away from any kind of statement within the scripture that might even hint at magic. And if we believe that talking about nature as a responsive autonomous um, entity, uh, for lack of better word, if we, if we don't, you know, we don't believe that, then we, we pull back from these passages. We don't want to, to embrace what they might actually have to say. So another aspect of why we may not read these passages literally is 
there is this practice, and it's very popular in so many schools of thought and many churches today to myth- demythologize the Bible. You know, all the deeds and activities are attributed either to humanity, to God. Occasionally, you'll get Satan thrown in there. But no other persons are really allowed to act within the framework that most churches approach the Bible under. Uh, you know, they, they've got this idea that everything is relegated to those three categories when we're talking about having free will, having the ability to respond. And I think we're, we're already aware of that. I mean, we've seen that with Heiser's work. I mean, every, when he first brought out his Unseen Realm book, I mean, everybody was like, he's talking about polytheism. He's mm-hmm. talking about henotheism. And it, it's like, no, you guys are missing the point. Because it was so wild to us, the idea that there might actually be other spiritual beings that inhabit this world and the heavens and everything under the heavens that are not relegated to God, humanity, or Satan. And we we don't like to talk about that. I mean, if you bring up the idea that demons are not fallen angels, people lose their minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how many times I've had the conversation. That's not what the Bible says. It never says that, folks. And nobody can point you to that scripture because it doesn't exist. But trying to convince them of that is hard. Why? Because that's what they've been taught. Ever since they were a kid, that's what they've been taught. And so um, just for anybody who's not familiar, if you go back and you look at Second Temple writing, which actually does talk about um, demons, and I'm not saying that you know, we elevate Second Temple writing to the status of Scripture. That's not what I'm saying. I, but what they have recorded is that these are the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim. And when we look at the trends from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we actually see how that argument is supported within text, within the, the scriptural text. So um, even though it's not spelled out, we can see reasons that, to see how and why the Bible endorses this, this thought process. So anyway, the, the idea that, that creation could respond it is just completely foreign, and it's not something that's easily accepted by humanity. So, um, well, and, and th- this idea that nature responds to, to God and humans, uh, I just want to mention this and you should probably get that paper over to TJ, but on answers right. to giant questions, I know you and I talked about this, but uh, they've mentioned that a few times, this idea that, you know, in the creation narrative, um, you know, God says, let there be, and then the earth mm-hmm. brings forth trees. Yes. And then God says, let there be. And then the ocean, and it says the ocean brings forth <laughs> uh, creatures. Um, so I find that actually really interesting because we very much, I mean, we're not saying God didn't necessarily create those things, but we also, when we have in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was, you know, what we get is void and chaotic, or void without form, mm-hmm. but it's actually kind of wild wasteland that's chaotic. Mm-hmm. Um there's actually, and I don't remember where I came across this idea, but there was this idea that God, you know, created the heavens and the earth, and there was just all the chaos of everything that could be. And our, our creation account is actually God going, let these things stay. <laughs> I'm going to keep that. We're going to keep this concept, <laughs> We, you know, and, and going through this process where cre- the creation account is actually a limiting of, of what the universe could be in order to create an environment for man to exist. Well, I mean, if you think about, okay, so God is infinite, right? I think we all agree on that. And he's omnipotent. And when you think about what could exist in the imagination of that kind of God, I mean, everything we take for granted as, oh, this is the way it has to be, is so not the way it has to be. I mean, God could have done anything. And yes, he could have created a universe where, you know, all the planets were cone-shaped. And he would have created a mathematical system that would have supported that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, nothing we experience has to be the way we experience it. Right. Everything we have is a a manifestation of God's mercy and his wisdom. So we need to be in awe and thankful for that. But you are absolutely right. Because when you look at Genesis 1, and it says, you know, let the earth bring forth, we have to ask, are we talking about God creating the trees and the plants and the vegetation? Uh, that's Genesis 1.12, by the way. Or are we saying God has 
is telling creation, now this is what you're allowed to do. You are allowed to function as I have designed you to function. And is either one devaluing God's activity within that, or you know, is one elevating him more than the other? Uh, that I think that's something we have to consider. We, we have to be thinking about that. Are, are the limitations we, we're placing on God and his, his um, manifestation and demonstration of power and strength, are they, they something that we've inherited from our culture, or are they what the Bible actually tells us? Because, you know, I kind of have this thing where anytime you start to limit what God can do, I think you need to draw back and you need to check yourself mm-hmm. because it's not God who has a problem with the infinite. It's us. Right. <laughs> so yeah, the, the limits we place on God are the limits of our own imagination and the limits of our own, um, our, our own, uh, what, our own ideas of morality and our own socially acceptable ideas mm-hmm. uh, of what should and shouldn't be. Right. Right. And well, and that's, I think what I like about looking at that passage in Genesis is when you actually do take the time to stop and read that, you realize that what Jorstad is arguing is actually what's on the page. And we have just inserted this idea because we didn't stop to think about it. We, we didn't stop to consider that, yeah, maybe God was just telling the earth, hey, do what you're supposed to do. This is how I designed you. Now it's time for you to start the process. And so I, mean, I love that idea. Or Genesis 9.13, where God says, I have set a bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of, of the covenant between me and the earth, not the people of the earth. Now, we automatically just assume that that verse is talking about people. Mm-hmm. Why? I mean, why do we do that? Is it just because we're so narcissistic that God can only care about people? Uh, you know, is it because we haven't bothered to slow down and think about what is actually being said there? Yeah, well, and, it, and it's like going back to, uh, even back to Genesis 3. And I don't know mm-hmm. if you've already covered this idea, but, you know, I, I know we've mentioned it before, but, you know, when God says, when God pronounces the curses, he pronounces a curse on the serpent because of what he did, and he pronounces mm-hmm. a curse on the earth because of what humanity did. Exactly. What Adam, did. Adam and Eve. And, Adam and Eve are never cursed in Genesis three, and we. I think people need to realize that because I mean, we we throw around that, especially as women, the curse of Eve. Eve's not cursed. She, it, matter of fact, she's given a blessing. You know, you, the your offspring is going to crush the head of the serpent. Mm-hmm. So you know, when we read that with our cultural bias in place, we miss the point. And so I, and I'm so, so tired of people. Okay. I'm not going to go off on this too much. I'm so tired of people trying to say, oh, Eve was trying to control Adam. That's not in the passage. That's not in the Bible at all. And so her desire will be for her husband. When you insert the idea of control, you are actually inserting an idea into that text because it doesn't say she wants to control. It says she desires him. Well, you know, when you desire, God desires us. Does that mean he wants to control us? We should desire God. Does, I mean, Piper wrote a whole series on that, Desiring God. Does that mean that we're trying to control God? I mean, we have to pay attention to the ideas that we're imposing on the text. And I think that's the value of, of this kind of verse and, and study to make us pause and ask, what are we doing? Are we really being faithful or are we just letting those thoughts slip in very subconsciously? But basically what Jorstad comes down with is, there's two options. Uh, nature is either divine, and that's how it has to be if it's going to be active and responsive, or we believe that um, it's without the capacity to be active and responsive. And you know that's a false dichotomy, and this is not what she's arguing for, but she's saying this is what the systems that we have engaged within the religious world, that's the options they leave us. And so maybe there's a third option. And so we, we know just from personal experience that we can be alive and active and responsive as human beings, but we're not divine. Uh, our, our pets, our cats, our dogs are alive, active, and responsive, and they're not divine. So we, we don't need to make this weird criteria for the rest of, of creation is basically what she's arguing. So... The, the final argument against reading these passages, literally, and I know this is where you're going to, to take off, is that most of them are poetic. <laughs> and because they're poetic, 
this means we don't have to read them literally, right? <laughs> so, well, I and that's just that's such a weird argument to me. This this idea that <laughs> we shouldn't be doing theology, and I've heard this basically anytime someone with a bad systematic is backed into a corner, someone says, oh, well, it's that's poetic language. We shouldn't be doing all of our theology with poetry. And, uh, yeah, I know you've heard this rant a hundred times, Emily. <laughs> but it, well, and it, how many it, times but, but, does Jesus... But at, this, well, but at the same time, what, I, what I'm going for is like, but those are the same people who will hold out 100% for a literal must-happen six-day creation account. Mm-hmm. Which when, is poetry. Which is all poetry. <laughs> and and so right. it drives me nuts when you're talking out of both sides of your mouth on this stuff and mm-hmm. and saying that, you know, well, if we would just look at at, at how the science plays out in, in relation to the Bible, I'm sorry, but God, you know, the, I'm not saying that that science isn't reliable. I think it is. But I do think we need to look at what's actually being conveyed in the poetry as opposed mm-hmm. to trying mm-hmm. to make it some rigid, literal account yes. of things. And mm-hmm. I also think we need to upgrade what we're supposed to be trying to be taught when we do look at poetry. We're, we're mm-hmm. you know, making something not literal is not demoting it. Um, it's it's right. actually elevating it because then you can actually see what God's thinking when he writes it. Well, and, and, you know, how much of the poetry, and we've looked at this in previous episodes, where the poetry actually reveals what's going on in the spiritual realm behind the literal account. And we see this very clearly in Judges 4 and 5, where Judges 4 gives you that wonderful, you know, prose account of um, Deborah and Jael and Barak and Sisera. And then to explain what happens, we, we, on the spiritual side of things, then Deborah sings her song. Mm-hmm. And so the, the two are not exclusive. They give you that fuller perspective so that you aren't locked into the outright literal facts that we can weigh, touch, and feel. And we can actually get a glimpse into the spiritual accounts and the spiritual realm of what's happening to see how the two converge. Because one does not exclude the other. We, we as human beings do not ever have any kind of experience that's wholly physical or wholly spiritual. They converge within us because we're spiritual and physical beings. And, and this is the beauty of creation is that the spiritual can be experienced in the physical and the physical impacts the spiritual. And so to, to see that very clearly, all you've got to do is open up the Gospels. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we don't want to make some kind of weird division where, oh, the poetry has no, no meaning. No, the Bible clearly shows us that the poetry shows us something deeper and beyond what is going on that we can just simply witness. And this is the reason why the prophets speak in poetry. And this is why Jesus so often quoted from Psalms, because he knew the poetry revealed more than just a checklist of facts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, no, I was listening. So, I was listening to N.T. Wright the other day, and it, I found it really interesting. He was talking about Paul's letters and how, how really, I mean, in a lot of ways, the church has become very poor students of even the New Testament. Um, in, right. in the way we handle Paul, he he goes, most people know about one event in Paul's life, maybe two. They know that he was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. Mm-hmm. and that he was beheaded. And beyond that, we don't know much else. Right. And I was like, that is very true. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we really, we break it down. We, we like to go into his, the parts of his letters where he um, gives us direct instructions on how to do things, <laughs> but we oftentimes skip the parts where Paul does get very poetic. And, mm-hmm. and, into, and what Wright was saying was that um, he goes, oftentimes, he goes, I think we have the order backwards. He goes, I think these poems were things that Paul was reflecting on and, and drawing from to get to his, uh, his theology. He goes, I, I mm-hmm. think we're looking at it all backwards. And so I'm like, mm, that's interesting. So I, I want to get some more information on that at some point. But yeah, we, cause I, and I know, I do know that personally, I mean, as someone who is a songwriter, I know you, 
probably considered the lowest form of poetry, I don't know, these days. But, you know, there have been times where I'll write songs about stuff that I'm dealing with, and it takes me a couple weeks to really crack it open and go, okay, what was I trying to tell myself here? Right. (laughs) I mean, that's just kind of how it works. And I don't know if that's God trying to talk to me through songs that I'm writing, or, or what that interprets into, but I know that it's true that sometimes you can really back yourself into some deeper truths uh, through poetry. Well, and you go back to the fact that, you know, so much of the history of the Bible is during a a time where oral tradition was so important. So how do you convey truth? Through poems and songs and things that can be easily remembered. And so, you know, what did Deborah command the people? Teach this song at the water wells. Be sure that in the public places, people know about this. How do they know about what happened? It wasn't the literal facts of the, of the battle that she wanted people to know. She wanted them to know about the spiritual truth of it. That was where the emphasis was. And that was one of the oldest parts of the Bible, right up there with the song of Miriam after they crossed the Red Sea, another oldest part. So when we look at the oldest parts of the Bible, the parts that have been preserved from the earliest date, we're talking about poetry, we're talking about songs. And so, you know, evidently these are pretty significant because we've held on to them for literally millennia. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and then, then there's the, you know, in Deuteronomy 32, that's a song that mm-hmm. God tells Moses to write so his people mm-hmm. can learn how to live their lives. Yeah. Now imagine, I mean, how many, um, how much more Bible would you have memorized if you actually sang it? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, because uh, well, I'm say for, uh, before we leave the thir- Psalm 32 thing, I want to mention you because know, that that's God using, He's using poetry to teach music and doing or to teach theology, you know, just doing theology mm-hmm. with music. And the other thing that I found interesting, um, there is I can't remember the guy's name, but I was I, was, I listened to, to too much stuff uh, to be <laughs> honest. But uh, one of the guy I was listening to a guy, and he grew up in a, the Marianite tradition. And mm-hmm. he said in, in that tradition, um, they, they don't consider it right or proper to say things that are sacred. You sing things that are sacred. And, oh, that's interesting. And so the, he said by the time he was a teenager, he actually had all four of the Gospels memorized because in his tradition, you always sang the words of the Gospels. Oh, I like that. So I, like that. I, I thought that was very cool. Um, I don't know much about the Marianite traditions, but that's kind of beside the point. But I just thought that was a really awesome uh, way of thinking things. Whether the rest of it's right or wrong is still a good idea. So, I mean, t- grab hold of good ideas where you find them. But one of the, the reasons why this poetry argument breaks down uh, is because a lot of these um, examples of nature responding to God and to human, uh, humanity's activities in the earth aren't found in the Psalms or the, um, the prophetic books where it's poetry, uh, such as 2 Samuel 18.8, where, I mean, we just have this account, this, this narrative, and then all of a sudden you get this line tossed in, and the writer just goes on. So then we have Genesis 4, where we've moved out of that poetic stage of Genesis 1 and 2, and now we're into just an account. It's not presented like poetry. And then we have Leviticus. Now, this is really interesting to me. In Leviticus 25, 4 through 5, there is a description of the land having moral and cultic responsibilities. And I just thought, okay, that's a crazy way to put that because I had never, I would have never phrased it that way. So I really do like having people who are smarter than me uh, help explain stuff like that. So I just want to read what 4 and 5 says. It says, but in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath, a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land. Notice not the people. A Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. So specifically, the land is getting to take a Sabbath. And it says, you know, that the land is going to enjoy it. And we get this again in Leviticus 26, 34, and 35. And then we have um, other passages in, uh, in Leviticus that talks about the land vomiting out those that uh, do not respect God's law. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Joel, Amos all describe the land as being in mourning. 
Psalms 69, 89, 148 all talk about nature praising God. Judges 5 talks about the stars fighting and the river breaking off its bank. And it's the, the earth that is said to devour Korah and his sons. And we talked about Korah and his sons on a few previous episodes. Deuteronomy has heaven and earth bearing witness to Israel's violation of the covenant, which is fitting because so much of Deuteronomy is um, focused on the land and its relationship to the people and to God. In Genesis, the sun, moon, stars are commissioned uh, to serve as signs. And now what's really interesting is a lot of scholars will actually make an exception in this creation kind of um, vocabulary for the sun, moon, and stars, because we've talked about this too, uh, about that star language where stars are often presented as gods. Mm -hmm. And with that that little E Elohim, those spiritual beings that were set up over people. So we've got several places, not just, we've got definitely the, the prophetic, definitely in the Psalms, but then we also have these narratives and then within the Torah itself. So in Genesis 4, like I said, the blood swallows up the earth. And it um, swallows up the blood. Sorry, yeah, the earth swallows up the blood. Now, what's interesting in that passage is if you look at the verbs, the, the verbs for the ground are active. The verbs for Cain are all passive, or they're speaking about a future event. So it's the earth who's the active participant in this, not Cain. And I thought, that's really interesting. Now, Jorstad sees this um, as the reason why Cain's no longer allowed to be a farmer. It's not that God stops him. It's that the earth itself refuses to yield produce to Cain because Cain has violated the earth. Mm-hmm. And so she, uh, she supports this by appealing to Job 31, 38 through 40, because Job in those, in those verses says his righteousness is being pro- proven by the fact that his land is fruitful and that if he had not been innocent, basically, the, the land wouldn't pr- um, provide for him. It wouldn't yield any produce for him. And so that supports her argument even further, which, I mean, Good grief. That's an, that's an interesting thought, especially when you go back to the covenant in Deuteronomy, where the land is going to be fruitful and flowing with milk and honey, mm-hmm. and it's going to supply all your needs. And it's, um, she's kind of shifting the view from God causing these things to the earth saying, hey, I don't have to provide for people who don't, pr- don't respect my creator. And so I'm like, okay, that's kind of a mind-blowing thought. Hmm. But in uh, Genesis 31, 48, 52, Deuteronomy 4, 26, Deuteronomy 30, 19, 31, 29, Joshua 24, 23, and 27, again, the stones are called to witness. Um, in Genesis 47, 13 through 26, I know I'm hitting a lot here, but I, just, I was just blown away by the number of examples. And I didn't even include them all. But in Genesis 47, 36 through 30, uh, sorry, 13 through 26, uh, we talked about this on one of our previous episodes and when Joseph enslaves Egypt mm-hmm. and how that actually uh, led, you know, set the, the system in place for Egypt to then enslave Israel. But the Egyptians offered to sell themselves to Joseph. Remember, they were starving. And they said, you know, we'll be your slaves. But whenever they start talking about their land, they use the same verbs for the land as they do themselves. And so they're indicating that the land was enslaved with them and that the land could die like the people. So several verses in the Joseph narrative actually speak of the land as if it is a person. The, the land is um, not to be cut off by famine. That's in Genesis 41, 36. Joseph, Joseph accuses his brothers of coming to see the nakedness of the land. 42 through, uh, for chapter 42, verse 9. And Jorstad acknowledges that these might be metaphors. I mean, she, she doesn't discount that, but she does call them very unsatisfying. And she reminds us that the Genesis passages connect with Leviticus. So in Leviticus 25, 23, we learn that the land is God's. And we, we've talked about this some. But in 25, 42, we learn that the people are God's slaves. These are the verses and things that God has to say about his covenant with the people of Israel now that they're moving where? Into the land. And without the land, the people starve. And without people, then the land cannot accomplish its created purpose. And so there's this symbiotic relationship between humanity and the land. And, you know, I think that was something really easy for people to grasp back when there were more farmers 
back when we, you know, everybody had a garden in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Now, today, you know, we're kind of cut off from that. And I won't go into how detrimental that is, but, you know, just a real quick um, note, you know, people who spend all their time inside away from the sun, not being in contact with the ground, have more problems with depression. Mm -hmm. This is just science. So, um, but in moving on, Exodus 15, 12, the song of the sea, which I mentioned earlier, it's the sea that's mentioned as God's servant and the one who defeats um, Pharaoh. And so none of the people are mentioned in the song of the sea. None of the angels, none of the other um, spiritual beings. The sea is the active servant of God who responds to the command. In Leviticus 18, 25, the land becomes unclean and God punishes the iniquity of the land, not the people. And because God's punishing the land, the land vomits out the, its inhabitants. In Leviticus 18, 28, God warns Israel, don't do these things that's going to cause the land to vom vomit you out like it did the predecessors. In 1929, uh, do not make your daughter a prostitute lest the land fall into prostitution and the land become full, depra uh, full of depravity. 2022, more vomiting. 25.2, the land shall keep the, the Sabbath. 25.4, um, the Sabbath is a rest for the land. 26.34, the land shall enjoy the Sabbaths. And I think it's interesting that the land is credited with being able to enjoy the Sabbath. So in, in Leviticus 25 and 26, we have these passages where there is no ambiguity. There, the language is talking specifically about the land. There's no way you can really read a metaphor into that unless you, you're trying. And so when we read those passages, and you, I think everybody should just take time to go back and read them, we're talking about that symbiotic relationship between humanity and the actual land itself. So um, in 26, Leviticus 26, uh, the land isn't worked. Why? Because, and it's enjoying its Sabbath because the people are in exile. And so basically the land has, has been freed of oppressors under this part of the covenant, and now it can rest because it's no longer being tormented by evil people who don't um, respect God. Numbers 13.32, again, the land devours the people. That's the warning. If you sin, the land will devour you. And Numbers 16.30 through 40, that's exactly what the land does with, the sons of, with Korah and his sons. Mm -hmm. So, and it's the land that's credited with that act, not God. Um, then when we move into the prophets, which when I say prophets, I'm talking according to the Hebrew Bible, because that's what her, her paper's about. Uh, that starts with Joshua. And we have three significant times where nature participates in the battle, in the war. So Joshua 10, 12 through 13, that command to the sun. Judges 5, where uh, Deborah praises the stars that fight from their courses. And the heavens that drop and the Kishon uh, Wadi, uh, the river in there just flooding and, and wiping away the, the armies. And then we have 2 Samuel 18, 8, which is where we are in our study. Now, I'm just going to read what Jorstead has to say about 2 Samuel 18, 8. She says, the narrator does not elaborate or discuss the participation of the forest, nor do any of the characters within the story. To the writer, it seems the participation of the forest is a matter of course, not an enchanting fairy tale element, but the kind of thing one would expect in battles. The participation of the forest seems to serve as a legitimization of David's right vis-a-vis -vis his son. Even the trees support his claims. So um, she goes on into the, the, the rest of the books of the prophets and uh, the Psalms, which I, I'm not going to go into all of those. I think we've already kind of established this, this language is pervasive, mm -hmm. uh, at least in the Torah. And then it just grows from there. Um, but I did find her, her section on theophanies, which is really about nature's uh, reaction to the arrival of the creator. So we have awe and trembling and joy and celebration all of these emotions and emotional reactions that we attribute to humanity, that the Bible is saying the earth is going to express, mm -hmm. that the, the land itself is going to express. And now, do I agree with Jorston completely? I, 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 uh, George Dodge, sorry. I don't know if I do. However, what I think is important about what she's written here is it really forces you to confront how you're reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, 
do do we do we take these passages literally? Um, what you know, why or why not? Uh, why do we automatically assume it's a metaphor? Are we re- doing that correctly? Uh, I don't think it's an imp- you know th- this is not an important issue for salvation. So let's get that clear. I'm not saying everybody needs to agree on this, but I think it does reveal our intent in how we deal with biblical passages. And if we're, we are making exceptions for these passages and we're saying, no, they're just metaphors. We don't have to read them literally. It's just poetic speak. Are we, you know, why? You know, that's, that's the real question. Why are we doing that? Is it because it's just too much? Does it push us so far out of our comfort zone that we don't want to entertain the thought? Who defined our comfort zone? And, you know, are we letting the text do that? Are we letting society um, to do that? So I, I really, when we look at these issues, it's not to convince people, hey, you know what, the trees can, can fight a battle for you. I, I don't know. Maybe they can. I know if God says they can, I definitely believe that they can. Um, is it something innate within them? That's a really good question. Um, I, I'm, by presenting these ideas, because I want people to, to pause and to, to wonder about what are we missing? What, 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 what can we be overlooking in the way we approach Scripture? And are we being careful with how we approach Scripture and taking these things in the, right, in the way that the writer meant them? And, you know, we've already, I think for a lot of our audience, too, um, they've already kind of confronted that mindset whenever they started looking at Heiser and the Divine Council worldview. And so, you know, we, we've already seen how we, we get out of line mm-hmm. and how easily it is to, to discount these passages because we don't want to confront something that makes us uncomfortable. And if that's the only reason that we're avoiding confronting these or taking these literal, we're doing it for the wrong reason. Now, is there some validity in the idea that, that nature can respond? I, I do think there is. Because, I mean, even Jesus talks about, you know, if the people don't praise him, then the rocks will cry out. And so even Jesus seems to acknowledge that there is some validity to this mindset. We know Paul talks about the earth groaning for its redemption. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't know practically or functionally what this reveals to us other than we need to be taking good care of this planet. And we don't have to debate that. Because that's what God told us to do back in Genesis. We're stewards of the land Mm -hmm. and we're stewards of the earth. And so we, you know, we need to be taking care of this place. We need to make, be making it a good home. And we need to be making sure that the land that we're in charge of, we're actually doing our best to, to create a, a welcoming, inviting environment where people can enjoy and experience God's presence in that place. And so if we're not doing that, then we're not, being, we're not being faithful to the command that we've been given because it's all about how do we get back to Eden? I mean, and that's very simplistic. Um, and we, I don't want to, that's just a complicated idea. We are all supposed to have that time where we walk with God, where we can learn from God. That's the point of salvation. It's not so we can go sit and play harps on a cloud somewhere. It's so that we can still engage in work that he has for humanity that he designed for humanity since the beginning of time. Mm-hmm. So um, that, I mean, I just find it to be, it was just a fascinating paper and I think everyone should read it. So anyway, real quick, I know we don't have a lot of time, but let's go ahead and get back to second Samuel 18 because I don't want to um, just leave on that note. Um, so we're going to pick up in verse nine. It says, and Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule And the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak, and his head was caught fast in the oak, and he was suspended between heaven and earth, while the mule that was was under him went on. Okay, so (laughs) we've we've had this passage of, you know, where there could be this great divine supernatural intervention in the battle. But I want to be very clear here. There is absolutely nothing supernatural about a mule going underneath a branch intentionally to knock a rider off, okay? That's how those things were designed. Mm -hmm. They're mean, evil, conniving creatures. (laughs) There's a reason why God tells us in the Torah, don't breed them. They are not to be part of the promised 
community, the covenant community. I'm and pretty so, sure that's not the reason that command is there. <laughs> it's not. Could be. I'm pretty sure it's not specifically it, for mules. It could be. It it could be part of the reason. Oh, that's. I drink my coffee. That's. Funny. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, the Torah says they just shouldn't exist. That's Leviticus 1919. Uh, no, it, that really is about the separation. You don't interbreed different creatures. You don't, you know, you don't mix your fabrics. You, you don't plant the sa- two different crops in the same area. You, everything's separate. You, you keep that distinction because that's a reflection of God's holiness and the separateness that he is manifest. So, I mean, yeah, that's the real reason. But, you know, often spiritual reasons have a great practical application. And in this case, it's mules, I'm telling you. Um, You know, God just knew they were too ornery to exist among blessed people. So now we we do know that all of David's sons rode mules. And if David and his sons were not breaking the Torah, then these were probably animals that were captured in raids or they were given as gifts from uh, foreign kings honoring David. So, you know, they're, they're rare. Is pretty much the point. They're rare. Mm-hmm. And because they're rare, they are a status symbol. Now, I have lots of friends who, who like mules. My daughter loves mules. Our father loved mules for whatever reason. Um, they are fabulous for uh, hunts. A lot of people use them for um, coyote hunts and stuff like that because they jump and they've, they're short-footed and they, they've got uh, good speed. But because mules are, are rare, in Israel, and only David's sons rode mules. This is really kind of a um, of a picture of what's happening here. Solomon, I mean, Absalom is losing his royal seat, literally and figuratively, in this moment. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not just he, you know, he got caught in a tree. It's that he is being dethroned, and that's what you're supposed to be seeing in this picture. Because, um, you know, the, the kingdom's going to continue without him, just like that mule continued without him. He's the one who's stuck. Now, various traditions clarify that so- Absalom was caught. I don't know why I want to call him Solomon. Maybe I'm just anticipation. Anyway, Absalom was caught by his hair and not his head proper. Now, uh, the, one of the things in the Tor- uh, Talmud, uh, Sota 9b, says he was haughty because of his hair, so he was hanged by his hair. Uh, Josephus says, but as he was carried with violence and noise and a great motion as being himself light, he, he entangled his hair greatly in the large boughs of a knotty tree that spread a great way. And there he hung after a surprising manner. Got to love the way Josephus writes. He was <laughs> such a propaganda guy. He's, he's hilarious. Um, but the word here uh, translated thick branches is a hepex ligamen, uh, which is related to an Arabic, Arabic word. Now, basically what that means is it only happens once in the Bible. We don't have thick branches, this word, anyplace else in the Bible. We do have it in the Arabic. So uh, we can look at the Arabic because the two languages are so closely connected and kind of get an idea what the Hebrew probably means. Mm-hmm. And it means entangled or in, intertwined. So there, there's this definitely the idea that there was some entanglement. It's kind of hard to entangle your head. That's not something that gets tangled easily, but the the hair gets tangled. Now, Zamora points out that, you know, in Japanese, head and hair are are used interchangeably, so it doesn't have to be an either or. I think we do that to a certain degree with the English. Um, I think this is one time where we can definitely see that a literal reading of this particular text would actually lead to more confusion than anything else. Uh, You know, Use some common sense. That's not an evil thing to do with the Bible, to use some common sense and say, okay, how does this work? Uh, Most of the time, you can solve these problems. Occasionally, we need to ask whether our common sense is overriding what the Bible is actually saying, or if we're, um, you know, it's finding that balance. You can't just read the Bible with your brain shut off. You've got to hold all these things in tension if you're going to dig out and mine out those little nuggets that, that really illuminate what the text is trying to say. Mm-hmm. And, you know, don't be afraid to, um, don't be afraid to consult experts. So now the detail of the, um, of it being an oak is interesting because Genesis 35, eight, we know that an oak is used as burial sites. Uh, that was where Rebecca's nurse was, was buried. 
Uh, it's also where uh, sacred items from denounced gods were buried. That's 35.4. Uh, it's also a place where God meets with people. And so Judges 16, 11, and 19, this is where God meets with Gideon. In Ezekiel 6, 13, this is where God condemns those worshiping under the oak. Hosea 4, 13, God again talks about the oak trees and meeting with gods here. So you're not just God of the Bible, but also all gods can be met at the oak tree. There's something very symbolic about the oak. Um, destruction of oak trees is part of divine judgment. That's Isaiah 1.30, 44.14, Amos 2.9, Zechariah 11.2. But the righteous are preserved, and they're compared to oaks in Isaiah 61.3. So when we see Absalom in this oak, we have the, these themes that come together. There's the renunciation of false gods. Remember who kings represented. Kings were the living embodiment representation of gods or God. Uh, the revelation of the true God is happening here. Mm -hmm. Death and judgment for God's enemies, the, the false gods being renounced and being buried there, and the blessing and res uh, restoration for God's uh, chosen people, God's chosen leader. All of this is happening within the narrative. Absalom's being dethroned. David is going to retake the throne. He's going to re uh, return to his place as the king of Israel and God's representative for Israel. And so we, we have this really cool event happening here where all of this comes together in this one moment and it, it's just it, it's very full and it's very rich and the writer has managed to to bring us this picture that that extends again like he so often does back to genesis and all the way forward to revelation mm -hmm. now absalom is suspended between heaven and earth and brueggemann makes the most of this as we expect brueggemann to do um, this in-between state, it, it, he, he cites it as Absalom not only being between heaven and earth, he's between life and death, the sentence of a rebel, and the value of the son, between the severity of a king and the yearning of a father. So Brueggemann sees all of these things being kind of encapsulated within that moment, that Absalom is in between. And so you have to kind of wonder what would happen in this moment if David had showed up instead of Joab. Because, you know, David's last command with, uh, concerning his son was deal gently or cover the young man, Absalom. Mm -hmm. So Joab is getting ready to make an interesting uh, move here that, that leaves a lot of things up for questions. Um, so we're going to get into next week about how this hanging of Absalom connects back to the hanging of Ahithophel in the previous chapter because we've got two people hung back to back. Mm -hmm. And I, you, you know, until we started the study, I really hadn't paid attention to the fact that we had that, that that was part of the, the text. Right. And so we're going to see what the writer does with these two stories being told together this way. So um, I think that's probably a pretty good place to, to wrap up for the week. Yeah. And I hope it was interesting because I had a lot of fun, like digging that out. Uh, there's, there was a lot of really interesting things in there just a lot of a lot of fun little nuggets again don't know what it means to the for the day to day <laughs> but um we can we can speculate you know does that mean we should be taking better care of the earth does that mm -hmm. mean we should expect more from it i don't know uh, <laughs> well i mean why not i mean what what's wrong with going out and saying okay lord let's let's talk about this this plot of land what what do we do with it yeah i mean is that wrong i mean that it, that can't be wrong so, you know, I, I think a lot of things you have to look at and go, okay, maybe this isn't specifically commanded by the Bible to do, but does it violate anything that the Bible tells us to do? Right. And, you know, and it doesn't. I mean, so to ask God, you know, how do we, how do we care for the land under our care? That's, I think that's good. I think it's healthy. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Yeah, that, is, that seems like we should, yeah, we'll go ahead and break there and we'll see everyone next week. Thanks for joining us. If you are interested in being part of the conversation, ravencreeksc.com is the website. Raven Creek on all the social media. Uh, you can find us there. Send us a message. Let us know if you have any questions, comments, or other uh, remarks. I guess probably the word <laughs> I'm looking for there. And we will see you next time. Bye. <laughs> Bye. You've been listening to the Faith and Other Oddities podcast, a Raven Creek Social Club production. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
If you like what you've heard, please write us a review on iTunes or consider supporting us on patreon.com slash ravencreeksc. As always, thank you for listening and don't forget to join us next week.